I've always made a decision early in life, I'm never going to work for a multi-billionaire. Mm -hmm. So you now have multi-billionaires buying up newspapers. And um, I just don't like billionaires being involved in newspapers because at some point there's going to be a, a clash of culture. Uh, well, what happens in America now is um, uh, uh, Trump is catnip for, uh, for uh, t uh, cable television. Trump tweets and they blast it out and they love it and they can attack him and don't attack him. And so what you have is a situation where um, even the New York Times gets into it. They chase the tweets. And you know, my take on Trump, obviously I have a million problems with him, but I think the media is underestimating him enormously. He took down 15 in the, in the, in the whether you like the process or not, during the, um, the run-up, during the, re, the, the run-up for the Republican nomination, there were 15, he was, there were 16 candidates, he was one. He took down 15 candidates who, between them, I know somebody who's done a count of it, come close to 300 years of, of professional political experience. He had zip. He took them down. He took down two dynasties, the Bush dynasties, you know, and the Clinton dynasty. And now he's president, and now he's got everybody chasing his tweets on and back, back and forth, and not really looking at things. He had a problem the other week with a big problem with, the, with the separating uh, mothers and children uh, at the Mexican border. That started four, four months ago. Where was four months ago? Yeah, everybody's yeah. chasing tweets and not looking what he's doing. Collusion as, as implies, among other things, a mens rea. And it also applies a capability to take step one. Somebody who goes to meetings told me this with the guy. Take it, it, you, you take step one because you want to impact step two. This guy is impulse. He's total impulse. And it's very hard for him to, you're, in order to connect a meeting with people and some long-term project, long-term goal, like getting the Russians to intervene, presumably, um, you have to have a president that is capable, and he's really not. He's really a short-term guy. And there are other things. The bottom line uh, is that I lived through 9-11. And after 9-11, um, when, the, when the perpetrator was Al-Qaeda, I watched as the President of the United States uh, uh, attacked the Taliban, who were not Al-Qaeda, in, in Afghanistan. And at the time when we decided for irrational reasons to start a war on terrorism, which is a war on, on an idea, um, we also began to build up for the war in Iraq very early. That was always the goal of the neocons because I, Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons and posed a threat to us, so they thought. And so after 9-11, we were told that the intelligence community had high confidence that there were w, that was WMD, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. There had been none. And so when, when the government says they have high confidence in something, um, uh, my experience was that means they didn't know jack shit. And so when they start <laughs> saying they have high confidence that Russia intervened in the election, I have the same conclusion. I can tell you that our, our government is capable um, you know, we mind, America whines and moans, oh, just we could be like the, the GCHQ, the British system here, which doesn't need a warrant to war anybody. We have laws. You, theoretically, you can't go after an American citizen without a warrant. And we always complain about the Russians and the Chinese, but we are really good experts at tapping into other people. And I know, we know about the alleged Russian tapping. I know we know who did it, and we're not saying anything. And believe me, if we knew who did it was Russia, we'd say something. <laughs> Our current president is a liar. He's a liar, and he's this kind of a liar. He'll do an interview, and at the end of the interview, he'll say, well, that's really terrific. Thank you so much for that statement about Spain was just terrific. What's the, I didn't say that. That's the kind of lie he does. It's a, he's a lie. It's the kind of lie that it's so easy to catch. It's comical. And it's, it, it's, and I, it's a, uh, you know, I, I I don't know about his mothering, so it has something to do with that, I'm sure. Anyway, it goes back to something in childhood. It's, a, it's a, a crazy. It's a really crazy. And Johnson, Lyndon Johnson put troops 
large numbers of troops into Vietnam in beginning in 1960, 1965 and lied about it for four or five months. It was a secret. And he put the Marines in there in July. And that was a secret after telling the American people, I'm not going to expand the war. Robert McNamara acknowledged, I, covered, I, 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 I made McNamara as a psychotic liar when I worked for the AP in 1965, just about other issues about pilot retention and airplane loss. He just lied. He just lied about everything. He finally wrote a memoir uh, 25 years after the war saying he knew for the last two years he was Secretary of Defense that we wouldn't win the war. Uh, how many lives should be on his soul? How many lives should be on Johnson's soul? And so Kennedy started it. Um, the great uh, I, Kennedy, there's always been a big argument whether John F., his, his aides all say that he would have ended the war. But I, the, the Kennedys I knew were big believers in payback. And, and, and ca the reason they kept on trying to kill Castro, they were trying on the day Jack Kennedy was assassinated. The reason they tried 15, 20 times is because he, he did what he did in the Bay of Pigs. And uh, for Vietnam not to work out, at the, best, at the best you can say for Jack Kennedy, he was certainly going to keep the war going till the next election. And so the cynicism, how many Americans died between the day he died and the next election would have died. I don't know. I'm just talking about lives on people's souls. So you can't count Kennedy. He also started ham fortified hamlets, nation building, special forces. He started a lot of horrible things that, uh, that began. So he's, he's not a winner. Nixon is not a winner. Uh, Jimmy Carter was OK until he decided in 1979 that we're going to give the Russians their own uh, taste of Vietnam, and he used um, uh, bin Laden, among others. He used uh, a lot of um, radical mu uh, uh, extreme Muslims, uh, mostly Muslims, and he used third worry, third party people to fight the proxy war. He also, nobody pays any attention, some of you might remember the horrible things that happened um, in, I'm trying to remember, um, uh, in North Africa. Algeria was blown apart uh, in the 1990s uh, with incredible violence from, from radicals. And there was a civil war basically there. Most of the major leaders of that civil war had joined the fight against the Russians with Al Qaeda and other people and were paid by us and controlled by us. And so um, Carter was okay, uh, except in the end he ended up, and by the way, probably the most stable government that existed, I'm just gonna say this to you, it doesn't mean I love Russia, was a Russian government set up by the Russians. If you go read the history of Afghanistan, one of the most stable governments was the Russian one, the one set up by the Russians that we overthrew that led to all sorts of craziness forever to this day. Reagan um, had his Iran-Contra policy, and he supported the, the, uh, the, ant the war against the Sardinistas, and he also had his scandal where he was arming, sending arms to, um, to Iran um, and, and they were selling arms and getting money and using that money for, to run a proxy <coughs> war against Sardinista, Oliver North, that stuff. So he's, he's on the blacklist. Um, so I don't know, it's a pretty good, pretty interesting record. The nice, I'll say one thing I just, that I'll say about Clinton that's interesting. Clinton, if you think about it, he bombed Kosovo in 1999. And therefore, at that time, he was the first American president since the end of World War II the bomb white people, <laughs> which that was sort of novel. Okay, uh, Two weeks ago, there was an, um, an annual convention of something called IRE, Investigative Reporters and Editors. It's an annual meeting. It started in the 70s. And of course, I've always spoken there a, a lot of times. And, um, um, and they had the third largest crowd they ever had. 1,800, 1800 journalists came because, um, and this is in a downtime when the markets are slim and the good paying jobs are disappearing. There were, many of them were students, maybe, most of them were young journalists. There were some older guys giving panels. It's a, it's a, it's a full of, a, it's a workshop stuff. It's a lot of work, workshops. And the turnout was staggering. And so what it said is, to me and to the, the people running it, there's this incredible amount of idealism left. Particularly people see journalism as a way to change things. So there will be, there will be outlets. I, I think there's, there's uh, I, I can't see it, but there's going to be some, I don't want billionaires to buy newspapers. I don't want that. I don't want the Bezos of, I don't want that to happen. I, I think there's going to have to be 
somebody, it's, I, it's beyond my ken, somebody who understands the business in a way I don't, the business, I don't understand the business, somebody's gonna come up with a model. There will be things to do, and there'll be reporting. The real problem is, even in p places like Boston, where the Boston Globe is a powerful paper, has fallen on bad times, they rely on, on students at Boston College uh, Journalism School to supplant some of the local reporting. There'll still be a way. Weekly papers, I thought would be an answer, they failed. But there'll be, that, that many kids want to go into the business as they really see there's idealism left in America, and I'm sure, surely here in England. And uh, um, uh, your press is in slightly better shape. You've got a couple of good newspapers, but so many of them are so awful it's beyond belief.